CC, the classic car show. In this episode, we slip behind the wheel of a spectacular American classic sports car and take a close look at a racy Italian. We slide on the overalls to see how this old girl is still on the road after all these years. Also in the show, how well do you know your chrome? We'll put you to the test. We'll look at a car of today that may well turn out to be a classic of tomorrow. Plus a very cool open top classic from the early years of the Japanese car industry. So sit back and settle in for another ride through the past on CC Classic Cars. Japanese car manufacturer Datsun is probably best known for holding the title of the world's best-selling sports car, thanks to its 70s performer, the 240Z. There were more humble beginnings for Datsun in the sports car market, and many consider their previous effort a much more desirable classic roadster. This is the Datsun 2000 Sports, also known as the Fair Lady. The Fair Lady was created in the classic tradition of the British open top roadsters, popular in the US in the mid 60s to give Datsun a foothold in the world sports car market. There were several models of the Fair Lady built between 1965 and 1970. This model, the 2000 or SR311, was the last. When I was younger, um, my best friend had a Datsun 2000 Sports and I'd always wanted one, but uh, it took me a few years to actually put the cash together to, to own one. When, uh, when I got financial enough as in my, uh, in my 30s and 40s, I decided I'd go and find one. Robert purchased this car from a magazine while he was overseas and didn't expect the car before he bought it. This turned out to be a bit of a disappointment as the condition of the vehicle was poorer than he first thought and rather than use the car as a daily driver, he chose to restore it. The restoration process for this car uh, entailed uh, a complete body off uh, and uh, stripped down to bare metal. Uh, one good thing about these cars is that six bolts and a couple of electrical cables, uh, you can lift the body completely off the chassis so you can do one part at a time. Robert's car had the chassis completely stripped back and powder coated. All new suspension components were fitted and whatever needed to be replaced on the car was replaced. As they had three cars in the workshop at once, and as this vehicle was to be Robert's daily driver, he chose to use the best parts from the three. And considering this Datsun Roadster has been on the road for 15 years since its restoration, it's a credit to the work done to see it still looking so good. The Datsun 2000 Sports has a five-speed gearbox, a two-litre, 150 horsepower engine and will happily cruise all day at 100 miles an hour. Reliability was also a selling point. Originally designed to compete in the American Sports Car Championship in a 12-hour Sebring race in Florida, the 2000 Sports was built to endure long-form racing conditions. This racing pedigree has withstood the test of time, and these little Datsun roadsters are famous for their up and go, while other roadsters of the same era are often breaking down. The cars were only ever sold in Japan, America, Australia, South Africa, and a few cars were sold into Finland for some reason or other, we're not sure why. But uh, there were about 30 odd thousand sold in the States, two and a half thousand sold in Australia. And these days, very, very hard to come by good examples. 
Most cars in the 70s were thrashed pretty hard by young guys because they were cheap to buy. Uh, they went quick, so people bought them, crashed them, and uh, now most examples that you buy uh, have been rebuilt a few times and they're full of um, you know, plastic. So it's very hard to come by a very good car. Like most roasters, the roof is really, really great for keeping the sun off your head, but not much good at keeping out the rain. It's believed the best way to keep dry in a fair lady is to drive faster, a notion rarely complained about by their owners. What they did offer the new car buyer, though, was great design and performance inside and out. For starters, the car had a top speed in excess of 200 kilometres per hour, or just over 125 miles an hour, pretty quick for its day and much faster than the British roasters it was competing against. This was most likely due to two factors. The buying public was still infatuated with British roasters from MG, Austin Healey and Triumph, and pricing was competitive. Also, the Japanese car maker had yet to cement its reputation as a quality car builder, and it needed time to develop and prove its product would last through the years. We all have to agree though, this little Japanese roaster sure looks the part now. And as far as classics go, they can be had for a song if you're happy to do some work on them. Although a fully restored one like this beauty will set you back as much as a new car today. And what's the best thing about driving a car like this one? I really enjoy it. It'll be one of the last things I do before I die, I'm sure, is to drive one of these cars. And uh, I, uh, I'm sure if you had one or if you can get a chance to drive one, you really enjoy it. Here's a challenge for all you classic car fans. Know Your Chrome gives you a peek at some close-ups of classic chrome. Look at the shapes. Do you recognise the lines? Can you tell which car sports this shiny styling? It's too early for clues. But we can tell you it's a car, it's a classic, and it's very, very cool. Look closely, and we'll give you more hints later in the show. Next on CC, the classic car show. A barn find that's made it back on the road. A Porsche grade of tomorrow, and a groundbreaking US classic. The great thing about owning a classic car is that you don't have to be an expert or a mechanic to keep it maintained or restore it to its former glory. With simple four-stroke engines and basic electrical systems, classic and vintage cars are relatively easy to work with and almost anybody can roll up their sleeves and get a few jobs done. Take Neil Frost for example. He's only just 18 years old, yet he recently took up the challenge of restoring a 60-year-old vintage as part of a school project. About eight months ago, I found a 1948 Morris 840 Series E up in a winery. I've been working on it as part of a school project and done a few things on the engine, converting it from 6 volt to 12 volt and also fixing the brakes. Of course, undertaking a project like this is no mean feat and Neil sought out local experts to help him along the way. So I had a member from the Morris Register come and help me work on it and also the neighbour across the road helped me uh, work on the brakes and also yeah just converting it from the 6 volt to 12 volt and any queries I needed I would always ask the member from the car club. As with any old car that hasn't been maintained for years it's important to make sure the brakes are in good working order before hitting the road so this was one of the first jobs that Neil tackled. The first job I did on the car was remo removing the brakes that meant taking off the brake drum, the brake shoes, and the wheel cylinders. And then I took them to a place where they were reconditioned. And then when they came back, I put them all back on. When Neil first bought the car, it had a six volt battery, which are very hard to find. So his next job was to convert the car from a six volt to a 12 volt system. The headlights and indicators also needed replacing, as well as other parts like the fuel pump and the volt regulator. As we can see, the upholstery on this car does need a bit of work, 
and Neil plans to do a course with the local car club where he can learn the skills to repair the wear and tear on the vehicle's seats and panels. There's a few members in the car club that have done the course and have been willing to teach me, so at some stage I'd like to learn to reupholster the seats. One of the reasons Neil chose to work on the Morris 8 was that, although the car was built in 1948, it's still relatively easy to find spare parts. Luckily, many of the parts in this vehicle are the same as those found on its successor, the incredibly common Morris Minor. Parts are generally inexpensive and easy to find on the internet, so it's a good car to work on as a beginner. Yeah, it's a good car for a beginner to work on. They're very simple, not too complex. The modern cars like today are very, there's wires everywhere and just they're very hard to sort of get your hands in where these are just straightforward. You've got the engine, wheels, it's pretty much what a car is. One day Neil plans to spend some time on the bodywork by removing an odd dent and even giving the whole car a respray. But for now, Neil's just happy to have completed his project and got the car roadworthy. The best thing about working on this car was that I got to finish it and now I get to enjoy driving it. As it was easy to work on, it didn't take too long and now I can just sit back and enjoy driving. What you are looking at here is a classic of tomorrow. This is the Porsche Panamera. When Porsche announced this vehicle in 2009, there was a wave of controversy around its design. Critics were less than impressed with its unusual lines. Opinion, it seems, is cheap. Sales of the sleek four-door sports coupe with a hatch have surpassed everybody's expectations and have ensured that this unique vehicle goes down as a future classic. four-door hatch so popular? Well, it's a Porsche for a start, and when it comes to aspirational purchases, Porsches are often at the top of the list. Then, of course, there is the sell factor. The key, we think, to this sports car success is its practicality. We are guessing most Porsche buyers are males over 40. Therefore, they often have wives and kids. So what kind of sports car can a family man really buy without looking selfish? Here it is, the Porsche Panamera. Today's classic of tomorrow. And why is it a classic of tomorrow? It seems every Porsche becomes a classic. So on this one, we're just going with the flow. What you are looking at here is a Lamborghini Miura, one of only 300 or so left in the world. Credited as being the first commercial mid-engine sports car, only 764 Miuras were built between 1966 and 1972. Miura was an important design step for the Italian car maker. While company founder Ferruccio Lamborghini wanted the company to create powerful sedate touring cars, three engineers, Gian Piallo Dallara, Paolo Stanzani and Bob Wallace developed the prototype in their own time. It went on to be a hit in the 1966 Geneva Motor Show and body stylist Marcello Gandini got most of the credit. The Miura was a vehicle firmly placed between decades. Classic 60s styling combined with some 70s experimentation. This resulted in a car that was truly unique. Some consider the pop-up headlights to be a fad of the time, but in actual fact were a necessity. For the car to be legal in some countries like the USA, which had regulations on minimum headlight height, rather than restyle the body, the headlamps would raise up via small electric motors. The Miura was the epitome of 60s chic, and everybody who was anybody wanted to be seen in one of these exclusive cars. Frank Sinatra drove a Miura in the late 60s, as did UK model Twiggy. In fact, this car we are looking at now is said to be her car which was custom ordered from Lamborghini in 1970. For the Italian car maker, the Miura was a giant step in performance cars. There was such demand for the vehicle, the company could have kept selling them well beyond 1972 when they ceased production. So why did they stop? 
Well, Lamborghini was a small, boutique car maker who couldn't produce more than one model at a time. And they had a worthy successor in the wings, the Lamborghini Countach. So how well did you go with your first peak? How well did you know your chrome? Here's a quick update. Did you guess it right away, or are you still pondering? Take a look at these shots. We're showing you a little more of the car here, so you should be able to pick it. The answer is coming soon. Next on CC, Classic Cars, we reveal the Know Your Chrome mystery car, then it's over to Wine Country to catch up with a nice red.